So the first uh, invasion um, of the Greek world by Persia occurs in about, it occurs in 490. And um, the sort of central defining element of this is the Battle of Marathon, which uh, is depicted here and becomes really um, sort of central in a lot of um, Athenian iconography. And so you see it replicated in a lot of different images is sort of an indication of how central it was to how the Athenians kind of thought about their position in the Greek world moving forward. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Persian Empire, why it comes into conflict with the Greek world, uh, as well as the events sort of leading up to the actual uh, first invasion. So um, the sources for the first Persian invasion are rather limited. We do have um, some uh, some kind of idea of what happens from Aeschylus, but Aeschylus was a dramatist, so he produced tragedies. Um, he was one of the first to really kind of introduce this particular format, which we'll talk about later in the semester, and so he becomes known as the father of tragedy. Unfortunately, we know that Aeschylus produced uh, over 91 plays and only seven of them survive. He does not actually produce a play about Marathon that is um, still survives. If he did, it, it is lost. Um, which is really unfortunate because he would have been sort of uh, an eyewitness. He actually fought at Marathon. He fought at the other battles of Salamis and Plataea as well, which also kind of shows this overlap um, between what people did and uh, fighting. So every able-bodied adult was kind of expected to fight uh, in these wars. Um, he does write a play that uh, takes the Persian Wars um, as sort of the center of the narrative. That's his Persians, but that actually looks looks at the second invasion by Xerxes. It was performed at the Dionysia. So this is an annual religious festival in Athens. So three playwrights are chosen to produce three plays, which are performed over three days. Um, and then eventually one of the playwrights, one of the plays is chosen the winner. And in 472, it's Aeschylus. And these are scenes from um, the Persians depicted here. So the other main source that we have is Herodotus, who we've talked about before. Herodotus really provides sort of this bridge between myth and what we consider to be history. Um, he lives 484 to 425, so after the first Persian invasion. So he is alive at the time of the second Persian invasion. Um, or, or, I'm sorry, right after the second Persian invasion. So he doesn't actually experience any of these events himself. Um, he was probably writing down his history around 430, so about 50 years removed from these events. He's born in Halicarnassus, which is modern day Turkey, um, but then at some point he does move to Athens. Um, and one of the reasons why Herodotus is considered a historian, the way we think about historians today, is because he does seem to apply sort of a different method to um, his work, sort of this systematic investigation. He'll often talk about his sources. He'll often talk about um, skepticism of different information that he includes. He does write in prose, not verse, so a departure from sort of the myths or the Iliad. Um, and he does order events chronologically. Um, to some degree then, uh, some uh, later scholars, sort of first century Rome is the first to call him the father of history, um, but there also is sort of some questions in terms of how he depicts events. It is a very Greek-centric sort of point of view, and in particular, he really does um, present the Persians in a very negative light as sort of this threat to Greek independence. Um, and so this does have an effect on sort of how then later scholars, uh, sort of in the 18th and 19th century moving forward, thought about Western civilization, and particularly when they thought about the origins of Western civilization. And we've kind of seen this a little bit before, when at the very beginning of the semester, a lot of historians tend to sort of mark Greece as the origin of Western civilization. Um, and much of this comes from the way Herodotus sort of positions the Greeks in opposition to these different cultures in the East. So um, in part then, sort of one of the um, ways that this opposition develops is in thinking about language, language differences, and how that translates into ethnic differences. So this is a quote from the Greek writer Strabo, who's writing in 63 BC, so much later. But he actually talks about the origin of the word barbarian. And initially, 
It was used by the Greeks to just reference people who spoke a language that wasn't Greek. And um, the, the saying is that they would refer to them as, oh, they speak and it sounds like ba ba ba, and that becomes barbarian. And it wasn't necessarily pejorative or negative. It was just um, sort of recognition of difference. But as Strabo tells you here, over the course of time, in part because of the Persian Wars and the way Herodotus positions the Persians, um, it does become a derisive term. And that's obviously how we think of barbarian today. It has this whole sort of connotation. And a barbarian is almost, um, is, is not just non-civilized, but they're sort of a threat to civilization. And so when we think about this and we think about what we see in these Eastern um, cultures, they're extraordinarily advanced. And I'll talk about Persia in a second um, as sort of uh, an illustration of that. So why we do not sort of think about Western civilization originating in the East, uh, at least in the in the Middle East, um, is a lot of that has to do with sort of this legacy of Herodotus. And as you can see from this map here, to think about Greece as the origin of Western civilization, it isn't even a geographical sort of um, understanding. If you draw a line from sort of Scandinavia down that separates sort of Western Europe from Eastern Europe, Greece is firmly in that Eastern half. So this is very much a perspective and a subjective one. The other question about Herodotus as a source, um, so in the first century, he sort of coined the father of history, but many of his contemporaries actually called him the father of lies because they found a lot that was sort of suspect in um, his narrative. And so as you can see from this, he includes a lot of numbers. Some of them, like the 192 Athenians who fell, totally accurate. We know this from other sources, but other numbers in the second Persian invasion, Herodotus talks about 2 million Persians. So extremely exaggerated. Um, also, you can see he talks about sort of um, this experience of a particular soldier who is fighting up a zealous and how he encounters this giant. So clearly there's some elements of his work that seem to be a little suspect, but then we do know that some is accurate and can be corroborated. And you can see this very last sentence, Herodotus kind of suggests um, this sense of, uh, I'm just passing on information that was told to me. So he does kind of indicate sources, and at times he does kind of indicate skepticism, but he's still um, sort of a tricky text to work with. So ultimately, what causes the first sort of uh, Persian invasion? And in order to understand this, we need to track back to the growth of the Persian Empire itself. So the Persian dynasty are called the Achaemenids, and the founder of that dynasty is a man named Cyrus. And so you can see sort of the, um, the origins of what becomes this enormously large empire um, centered down there towards um, Persepolis, right off the Persian Gulf. And so it's Cyrus who first expands up into Asia Minor. Minor. And then he um, eventually incorporates so many different kind of ethnic groups and individual nations into this empire. And that's sort of what we mean by an empire, a lot of different um, individual entities subject to a single authority. Um, he establishes uh, these satrapies, so kind of like a province or a unit of governing. And then each satrap has a governor or, a, a satra or each satrapy has a satrap, which is a governor, sort of a provincial authority. But many of these entities are allowed to keep their own sort of form of governing. So if they're kind of further out east, they still have kings. If there are sort of these Ionian Greek city-states, they have uh, democracies or they have tyrants. Ultimately, then, they're all subject to the authority of um, the, the Persian emperor, even though they don't really use that term. They use the term king of kings. It's um, under his son Cambyses that the expansion continues, and Cambyses actually takes it into Egypt and controls Egypt. So Egypt still has sort of a government in place, but they still acknowledge sort of the overlordship of Cambyses. At its height, the Persian Empire probably has as many as sort of 40 million people subject to its authority. It covers 10% of the world's geography, that's a really vast amount of territory to be subject to a single authority. It's actually larger than Rome will ever be. So it's under Darius in 522 that we see the Persians sort of 
come into contact with the mainland Greek world uh, in a sort of a, a hostile way. Um, we don't know exactly how Darius manages to establish himself in control. He's not a descendant of Cambyses. There is a descendant of Cambyses. This is super hazy in the sources, so we don't know exactly what happens, but we do know that the Cambyses' son's uh, right to rule is questioned. There's a sort of a fairly large scale rebellion. Darius, who was a government official, comes out on top. And so he ends that rebellion and he establishes himself as the king of kings. And so you can see in this relief uh, how he is sort of depicted sitting on the throne and then accepting um, the uh, obeisance of uh, these um, people, uh, these envoys from these various other entities who are sort of paying him tribute. Um, one of the things about these Achaemenid um, emperors is they uh, do sort of recognize um, freedom of religion, sort of, so they're relatively speaking, considering ancient world, um, quite tolerant in terms of accepting different religions. There's never any attempt. They centralize administration, they centralize communication, um, to some degree they centralize authority, but they never try and impose a uniform religious system. So this is um, the Behustun inscription, um, and you can kind of see the angle is really rough, but it's inscribed on the side of this mountain. So this is a really enormous structure if you were to see it um, up close. There's a little ledge that the workers use to access this site, and what it does is it commemorates Darius's um, victory over that initial rebellion. And so you can kind of see in the figures here, their arms are shackled behind their backs. Um, and so the commemoration itself is inscribed above those figures in writing, um, cuneiform writing, in three different languages. So again, reflecting sort of this diversity um, of the population subject to uh, the Persians, but also um, the level of literacy that had been attained in this really advanced civilization that there were not only three different languages spoken, but each of those languages had its own written script. Um, so to return to the idea of um, religious beliefs, so one of the things that we do know is that the Achmenids um, worshipped a god named Ahura Mazda, so known as the sky god. The main prophet of Ahura Mazda was Zarathustra, so this religious system is often referred to as Zoroastrianism. This is one of the rare depictions of Ahura Mazda in human form. A lot of times he's just um, depicted as sort of a circle, noting sort of origins, um, but this is him him depicted handing um, the crown to this is one of Darius's successors. They have priests and priestesses who um, perform rituals called magi. And one of the interesting things that really sets this particular religious system apart from a lot of the other religious systems um, in the ancient world is this uh, recognition of free will, that at the end of the day, everyone has this free will. So this really contrasts to sort of the Greek notion of fate or that the outcome for you has been determined by the gods. It also is... Um, a belief system very much based on ethical behavior. So there are three imperatives, good thoughts, good deeds, and good words. Um, and again, sort of really contrast to what you see in sort of the Greek religious system where that sense of right and wrong is um, much different. Sort of another reflection of how advanced this Persian uh, society is, they had this system of elaborate roads known as royal roads. And so you can see this quote from Herodotus here, who may look similar to some of you, obviously the basis of the modern day U.S. postal system sort of um, mantra. Um, but these royal roads would stretch from in sort of the heart of the Persian Empire here um, in Susa all the way out to modern day Turkey, sort of uh, where uh, along the Mediterranean, um, the other capital at Sardis. These were 20 feet wide. They were paved, which is really unusual. And then you have a system of, um, like a, a system of, of exchanges all along the road where there would be fresh horses. So if the emperor was trying to send a communication to um, a place along that royal road, then the messengers could change horses at each of those stations um, and then have a fresh horse so that his pace would not diminish. According to Herodotus, these messengers could get from Sardis to Susa in only seven days, which is an incredible amount of territory to cover in a very short period of time. 
We can also see sort of the wealth and the resources of the Persian Empire, as well as their archaeological and architectural um, sort of uh, significance, sophistication in the um, city of Persepolis. So this is sort of the ceremonial capital of the empire. Um, a number of these Achaemenid emperors did build a palace there, though it doesn't seem to be sort of a long term residence. They maybe just came here for special occasions. This is uh, what you have pictured here is sort of a ramp that goes up to the top and it's known as the gate of all nations. So um, there's a lot of writings that uh, we have from this time, a lot of them inscriptions, but we don't have very many narrative accounts. So we have to piece things together. Um, but the, the thought is that at different moments during the year, the emperor would come to Persepolis and then all of the different um, uh, people subject to his authority would send like an envoy and then they would give him this obeisance and tribute. So this sort of monumental architecture is very much this overt demonstration of just the authority of the emperor, the wealth, the amount of resources at his disposal and what his commands can actually do. In 518, we know that Darius builds the Apadana, which is um, sort of a, a reception hall that's also at Persepolis, though a lot of the buildings at Persepolis today, as you can see here, are no longer fully intact. So the immediate catalyst of um, the Persian invasion of mainland Greece was a revolt that happens in Ionian Greece. So Ionian Greece refers to the city-states that are on um, and in Anatolia, so this is modern-day Turkey. So they're across the Aegean Sea from mainland Greece. There are quite a few of them, and they have been subject to Persian authority for some time. We don't know exactly what happens, but we do know in 499, the tyrant of Miletus, one of these Greek city-states, or Astagoras, um, gets a number of other city-states to overthrow the Persian presence within their walls and to declare their independence. Um, they reach out to the city-states in mainland Greece, especially um, Athens and Sparta and Corinth, and ask for their support. Most of the Greek city-states refuse. They're not interested in getting involved in these events. The exception is Athens and a small city-state not too far from Athens called Eritrea. Athens sends 20 ships, a pretty sort of modest contingent of soldiers. Eritrea sends five. They do participate in sort of the initial revolt, and they actually manage to march a force um, into the capital of Sardis to kill the Persian garrison there, to um, send the satrap uh, into exile. So sort of in, in the sort of um, immediate aftermath of the revolt, there are some successes. In part, this is because Darius is tending to other affairs further east within his empire. So he's not able to um, give this his immediate attention. However, by 494, Darius has come into Ionian Greece at the Battle of Lade. Um, uh, the, uh, the Greeks are defeated by the Persians. Most of them are just sort of granted clemency, though he does replace a lot of the tyrants that govern those city-states with democracies as a way to kind of, he thinks, provide more stability. Miletus itself is the one city that sort of bears the brunt of his wrath. The city is completely destroyed, or Stagoras is killed, and a lot of the women and children are enslaved. And then he does reinforce these Persian garrisons in these city-states just to further maintain his control control. So the next sort of um, event is a little bit um, up, open for question. Herodotus says that the Persian invasion was the direct result of Athenian participation in the Ionian revolt, that Darius sort of all of a sudden Athens is on his radar screen for the first time because of that participation, and so he wants to punish them. Other uh, events suggest a slightly different scenario. So in 499, he had sent envoys to Greece. So this is even before that revolt happens, right? Um, so he sends envoys across the Greek world demanding earth and water. So this was a symbolic um, gesture of submission and accepting him as the ultimate authority. 
A number of Greek city-states, especially those closer to Persia, did comply. Um, but we know that Sparta and Athens were two that refused and refused in very dramatic fashion. So this is an image from the movie The 300, which has Leonidas sort of rejecting the Persian envoy and in fact throwing him into a well. Not totally true. It was not Leonidas. He comes like 10 years later, but the Spartans did throw this, the Persian envoy into a well. They regretted it and they tried to make amends later, but they still did. And then we know that Athens actually throws the envoy off a mountain. So a very sort of dramatic refusal to comply, which um, then sort of uh, sets off this other chain of events that leads to the first invasion. So in September of 490 then, um, Darius is ready. He has an army mustered um, and he's going to take a fleet of about 30,000 ships. He's gonna sail across the Aegean. Remember if we track back to when we had a tyrant in Athens, and um, so the tyrant dies, Pisistratus dies, and then his son Hippias tries to succeed him, but eventually is forced into exile. Well, Hippias has been hanging out at the Persian court. So Darius's plan is to install Hippias as tyrant in Athens, and then he has this ally, and then Athens becomes sort of this gateway to the rest of the Greek world so that he can continue his conquest further west. Um, we do know that the center of his army is made up of immortals. These are Persian soldiers, so infantry. He does also rely on cavalry, archers, and spearmen. This is a very diverse army, so every nation that's conquered by Darius has to send a certain number of men to fight in his army. So there actually are a considerable number of Greeks who would have been fighting for him, not because they wanted to, but because they had to. These reliefs are really sort of um, useful in giving us an idea of how Persians fought their dress, their implements of war, and in particular sort of how that contrasts with Greek forms of fighting. So Darius set sail with this fleet of 30,000 ships. Um, what do the Greeks do? We know that Athens is very concerned, especially, um, so Dar Darius's first stop is the city-state of Eritrea, which also sort of participated in that rebellion. There is a pro-Persian faction in Eritrea, which opens the gates. Many of those who oppose Persia are killed, women and children are enslaved, um, and Eritrea itself is pretty um, severely damaged. Seeing that, Athens realizes that they need to do something, they need to make a decision. In 490, Miltiades was one of the 10 men who had been elected general. So they decide to march the Athenian army. They've got about 7,000 total hoplites north to meet up with the Persians as the Persians land at this um, particular sort of area uh, called the Bay of Marathon. This is one of the few places along the Greek coastline that you could actually land a fleet of 30,000 and they probably uh, choose this uh, on the advice of Hippias. So in the meantime, Athens sends um, a runner to Sparta to ask for reinforcements. We know that he runs there over the course of two days, so he wastes no time. The Spartans, however, are in the midst of a religious festival. That gives them this kind of convenient excuse to delay because they're not entirely sure. Opinion in Sparta is divided as to whether or not they want to help the Athenians or whether or not they just kind of want to let the Persians do what the Persians are going to do and hope that the Persians then don't sort of move further west. So um, Miltiades knows that he's alone. So you have this, um, the core of the army are these hoplites and he does have um, a few hoplites from the city state of Plataea. For some reason, and we're not quite clear, there's a five day delay. Um, Herodotus tells us it's because um, Miltiades is waiting until the day when he would get as general to lead the army. In any case, after five days, the Athenians decide to attack. And you can see kind of the formation here. They do have topography to their advantage. So this is sort of a marshy plain. So it's this flat 
beach, but then it's marsh on the two sides, on the right and the left there, and you can see those rivers. So on the other side of those rivers is sort of marshy terrain. So even though the Persians outnumber the Athenians by about at least 10 to 1, they can't really take advantage of their numerical supremacy because they're sort of locked into this tight spot. Miltiades lines up his army um, straight across with the center and the left flank and the right flank. Um, but then what starts to happen, we know, is as um, the, the Persians really want to use their archers, we don't know why, but the cavalry does not seem to take part in the battle at all. It could be because of that marshy terrain. But what Miltiades does is he charges um, which would be which would play perfectly to Persian advantage and their ability to use their um, their arrows. But the last 200 yards, um, he gives his men the um, command to run. So they cover that ground very quickly. They neutralize the impact of those um, bows and arrows. The two armies then engage in hand to hand combat. The center of the Greek army led by Miltiades falls back. Um, some say it's a ploy, but that's probably hindsight. They probably fell back because they're bearing the brunt of the Persian attack. But as the Persians, as they withdraw a bit, and that's what this schematic is intended to kind of show you, as they withdraw a bit, the Persians advance, but in doing so then, allow for those two Greek flanks to kind of move into place so that they literally outflank the Persian army. So then the Persians are fighting on the right side, the left side, and in front. And so it ends up being an enormous rout. As Herodotus tells us, only 192 um, hoplites from Athens are killed. The Persian losses number in the thousands, perhaps as many as 6,000. Immediately after the Greek victory, a runner, and this is what history tells us, his name is Pheidippus, a runner um, takes the message to Athens. The story tells us that he runs so fast over the course of the 26 miles from Marathon to Athens that as soon as he announces the victory, he drops dead on the spot. Probably not, but this is at least why we still have the marathon. It becomes a central event in the Olympic Games, um, and that's why when you run a marathon, it's 26.2 miles. So the impact of the victory immediately, the spoils of war are considerable. So the Persians flee. Um, as soon as they realize that the Greeks have bested them, they, they're trapped against the water, right? And this is probably why the Persian losses are so high. Many of them probably drown. Those who can get back into the ships and sail away do so as quickly as they can. So they leave behind their camp. They leave behind a lot of valuable wealth, which the Athenians then claim. And they are able to translate it into this statue of Athena, um, well, this replica of original statue of Athena, which is positioned in the Acropolis. The men who die at Marathon become almost sort of these heroes. So this is a Soros, a burial mound, right at the plain of Marathon. And so the men who die there become known as the Marathon Amakoi. So this becomes a hero cult. Um, and anyone who has a relative who fought or died at Marathon automatically has this sort of esteem uh, within their family. The other thing that it does is it very much fuels Athenian ambition. So the Athenians from here on out have proven that on their own, without Spartan help, the Spartan army actually arrives two days after the victory. They can defeat this much larger army. No one thought that they can do it. And this is really going to inform their sort of thinking and planning moving forward. The other thing that Marathon does is it really does solidify the hoplite phalanx as a superior fighting force, at least the way the Greeks do it. And I talked about the hoplite phalanx and some of its unique qualities earlier in the lecture on Archaic Greece, um, but really in managing to defeat this much, much larger Persian force, they realize how they can use this to their advantage. So the hoplite himself really excels in close range fighting and close range fighting is sort of a, a, a just a, a necessity. And this is why and we saw this in the Iliad, right? That hand to hand combat is sort of the most respected, the most valued. Um, a typical hoplite has about 40 pounds of bronze armor. So the shield, he also has um, the greaves that are covering his shins, the helmet, and then maybe a breastplate. 
Um, it, this does provide a lot more protection. The Persians we know have like a wicker shield and like linen armor that may be sort of reinforced, but is not nearly going to prevent um, the type of wounds that you can inflict with a spear or with a short uh, sword. Um, they do have light infantry that kind of complement the army when it goes into the field of battle. So they're faster because they don't have the heavy armor. And they do have some bowmen, so people who, who fight with a bow and arrow. But again, this isn't sort of the center of the army, the main, um, the main component of the army. And in part because southern Greece isn't conducive to horses. There's not a lot of pasture. Um, it's very rocky terrain. They never really sort of develop um, cavalry as a central part of how they fight. The phalanx then, um, coordination is absolutely essential to its effectiveness. The best terrain is sort of level, flat terrain. There's not a lot of that in the Southern Greek world. So this explains why a lot of the, um, the same sort of places uh, are used for battles over the course of time. They ideally have this tight formation, at least when they begin the battle, so that your shield will cover part of the man next to you um, and provide this extra layer of protection. Maintaining that formation once they engage in battle is, is kind of a challenge. And so we do know that when they um, go into battle formation and then when they first engage in the battle, oftentimes they'll sing a hymn or a paean. Um, this is a hymn to Ares, so it's sort of asking for his protection but it also performs this function of giving them a rhythm so that they can sort of align their marching. This is another way that they do that. You can see in this depiction here, the um, boy in the black is actually playing a flute. So he's, again, giving them um, sort of a rhythm that they can then match up their march to so they can stay in this tight battle formation. Typically, the phalanx is about eight men deep about 12 men across. They have a seven foot spear. So the range of that spear means that the man in the front row and the man right behind him are the only two that are actually really engaged in the fighting. The men behind then are then really there to prevent a retreat, but also if someone in the front two lines happens to fall or is wounded, someone can step up and take their place. Another interesting thing about the way the Greeks fight, especially as we move into the Peloponnesian Wars and you have Greeks fighting other Greeks, is there are these very clear conventions that regulate warfare. So for example, if two city-states have decided that they're going to fight, the first will um, begin to, to form into battle lines. The other gives them time to do that. And then they will form their own battle lines, but each sort of waits until the other is sort of set. So no surprise attacks. The other um, sort of kind of common agreement is that the first army to flee, to turn around and run away from battle is the losing side. Instead of pursuing them, they then begin to sort of claim their own dead and then allow the, the fleeing side, the losing side, to come back and claim their own dead after they kind of agree on who the victor is. So you don't pursue men who are fleeing from the, from the field of battle. And that's usually when the, the largest number of casualties happen is, is when people are fleeing. So this in part keeps these casualty rates low. I see numbers that suggest, I'm always skeptical of numbers, but it does give us an idea that in these, um, in these encounters, casualty rates may be 5% for the victors, maybe as high as 20% for the losing side, but still relatively, um, relatively low. And the other sort of convention that the Greeks observe for the most part is, while you might conquer territory as a result of um, a victory in battle, the women and the children are not harmed, they're not enslaved, um, and that there, you, you don't sort of, um, the war doesn't spill over into non-combatants. And so that's going to be kind of something moving forward that we'll also see with uh, the second um, Persian War and then the Peloponnesian Wars.